Hello, and welcome to the second installment in my 6809 Playground homebrew computer series. Today, I'm going to talk about the clock generator circuit. If you've been following along, welcome back. But if you're not familiar with the background of this project, I put a link to the introduction in the description below. OK, let's just get right into it. The 6809 has a two-phase clock whose signals are called E and Q. Now, if you're familiar with the 6502, E is analogous to the Phi 2 clock. Q, on the other hand, is not analogous to the 6502's Phi 1 clock, which is simply the inverse of Phi 2. Q is a quadrature clock, which is to say that its phase is offset by 90 degrees, or one quarter of a cycle, and in fact it leads the E clock by that amount. In addition to driving the state transitions inside the CPU itself, there are other things that we can know about the status of other bus signals based on those same clock transitions. First of all, the address bus and read-write signal are guaranteed to be valid on the rising edge of Q. Second, during a write cycle, data written to the CPU is guaranteed to be valid on the rising edge of E. Finally, during a read cycle, the CPU latches data from the data bus on the falling edge of E. Now, for the most part, peripherals don't really need to be concerned about Q. E is really where the action is for most parts of the system. But if for some reason you need to latch the address bus to meet the bus hold time for a slow peripheral or something like that, then Q is what you want to use for the trigger. There are two variants of the Motorola 6809 CPU whose main difference is in how the clocks are handled. The 6809 has an internal clock generator and it generates E and Q, which are then outputs to the rest of the system. You just need to supply a crystal and the appropriate support components. The 6809E, on the other hand, uses an external clock generator and E and Q are inputs to the CPU. This, along with the addition of the AVMA and busy signals, was done in order to support multiprocessor systems. In both cases, the clock generator circuitry divides the fundamental frequency by four when generating the two clock phases. In other words, if the design calls for the CPU and the system to run at one megahertz, then a four megahertz oscillator is required. I'll be using the 6809E variant in the playground, and this here is the example clock generator circuit from the 6809E datasheet. You can ignore the optional MREDI circuit since I don't need it and won't be building it but its behavior is equivalent to the mReady input signal on the 6809, which just stretches the clock as long as mReady is low, which is used to give extra time to slow memory devices or peripherals. As you can see, the clock generator is just a pair of JK flip-flops in a feedback arrangement with our clock inputs being driven by the oscillator. Q is taken from the first flip-flop and E is taken from the second flip-flop. Now, note that while the E signal that's sent to the rest of the system is taken directly from the flip-flop, the E signal that's sent to the CPU comes from a strong pull-up to VCC, which is then driven low by a transistor connected to the inverted flip-flop output. The 6809E datasheet notes that while Q is TTL compatible, the E input directly drives the internal NMOS circuitry without any sort of buffer in order to reduce clock skew, and thus it requires a higher on voltage than standard TTL outputs can provide. Specifically, the datasheet says VCC minus 0.75 volts, well, I'm building the clock module with 74 ACT parts, and I'm not sure that those can guarantee a 4.25 volt output in all circumstances. And so at least initially, I'll be using this technique to drive the CPU clock as well, except that instead of a bipolar transistor, I'm going to use a small MOSFET. This is the first version of my clock circuit. It's obviously a little more complicated than the datasheet example, but it works essentially the same way. The main difference is that I want to support multiple clock frequencies for different 6809 speed grades. So I'm using a 32 megahertz oscillator that then drives a 74 ACT163 binary counter to divide the clock down to 16, 8, and 4 megahertz. A jumper block selects which output from the counter to use to drive a 74 ACT109 JK flip-flop pair that generates E and Q. Now note that the 74109 is a little different than the 7476 that's in the datasheet example. The K input is inverted and so the circuit has been adapted to compensate. 74 ACT parts were chosen because 32 megahertz is well within their speed rating and they have a pretty strong output drive so I don't anticipate needing to buffer the clock signals at all. So as a first pass to verify the circuit, I put together a simulation in Logisim Evolution. Unfortunately, Logisim only has a generic JK flip-flop model so to mimic the behavior of the 74 ACT109, I put an inverter in front of each K input. The A label is connected to the 32 megahertz oscillator and the B, C, and D labels are the 16, 8, and 4 megahertz clocks, respectively. In this simulation, the flip-flop player is connected to the 4 megahertz signal, which is the setting for a 1 megahertz system clock. So when I start the simulation, 
we can see the counter dividing the oscillator frequency down. And then we can see how Q leads E by one quarter of a cycle. Then if we wait a little bit, we can then observe that both E and Q are one quarter of the frequency of D. Okay, it looks like this is gonna work out pretty well, but I think it wanna improve the clock speed selection just a bit. On these old 8-bit systems, it's common to count cycles in order to perform timing critical tasks. Of course, that only really works if you happen to know how much time a cycle takes. But if you can change the cycle time by moving a jumper, and you don't have any way for a program to know what position that jumper is in, then you're kind of in a pickle. So I want to have the jumper not only select a clock speed, but also to be able to indicate to software its current setting. This seems like a good application for a small programmable logic device like a GAL 22V10. Now I'm not gonna do a deep dive here on how a GAL works, but here's a brief overview for those who are unfamiliar with these devices. This particular device has 22 signal pins, of which 12 are inputs, and 10 of which can be configured as inputs or outputs, hence 22V10. The inputs are connected to a large AND gate fabric, and each output pin has a multi-input OR gate that connects the AND gate fabric to the pin's output logic macro cell. Each input and output can be inverted essentially for free. By combining the inverters, AND gates, and OR gates, any Boolean equation can be expressed using sum of products. The only real constraints are the lack of varied signals and the number of inputs to a given output pin's OR gate. They're not all the same. The outputs can be individually tri-stated and their enabled state is also controlled by a sum of products equation. Now, there are some folks out there who think retrocomputing projects should not be using anything other than the stone knives and bear skins available at the time, but I'm not one of those people. I think it's perfectly reasonable to use a GAL or other programmable logic device for this application. And for the PRS out there, I'll point out that the GAL 22V10 is a drop-in replacement for the older 22V10 PAL. And other 8-bit systems in the early 80s used these sorts of devices in their design as well. One pretty known example being the PLA and the Commodore 64, at least before Commodore started manufacturing their own chips for that purpose. To add to the vintage mystique, Lattice no longer makes the GAL 22V10, but they're readily available on the reclean electronics market, and Microchip, formerly Atmel, still makes a compatible chip the ATF 22V10. A GAL is programmed by writing a fuse map to its internal EEPROM. To generate that fuse map, you'll need a GAL assembler. I'm using a program called Galette, which is open source. It's written in Rust, and so it can be run on any system that the Rust language supports. And it uses essentially the same syntax as the pal -ASM logic description language developed for the old one-time programmable PALs back in the early 1980s. To write the fuse map into the GAL, I'll be using my TL8662 Plus EEPROM programmer, which works with both the older lattice parts as well as the newer microchip parts that have a slightly different programming requirement. What I like about this programmer is that it's uh, supported by the open source MiniPro software that you can use on BSD, Linux, and macOS. Okay, so thinking about what the clock selector needs to do, first of all, it needs to read the jumpers to determine which clock has been selected. Now I'm gonna be using combinatorial logic here, so this reading step is really kind of happening continuously. Um, I merely need to you know, consider the value of the jumper setting in the other logic equations. Then based on the jumper setting, it needs to route exactly one of the three clock inputs from the counter chip to the clock output. And then finally, when a program running on the CPU asks, it needs to present a read-only clock speed register to tell that program the jumper setting so that the program can do things like calibrate its delay loops and whatnot. In terms of I.O., it needs the three clock inputs, three jumper inputs, and a handful of signals that are required to interface with the 6809 bus so that the clock speed register can be accessed. It also needs a clock output to feed the JK flip-flop pair, and also eight data outputs to put the contents of the clock speed register out onto the data bus, but only when the bus interface signals tell it to do so. Now, all this you know, falls well within the capability of the GAL 22V10, so let's take a look at the logic required to make it all happen. There are really two distinct functional blocks within this clock selector. The first is the selector itself, and the second is the clock speed register that the CPU can read. Now, a great way to think about logic equations is to build a truth table to describe the desired behavior. This is the truth table for the clock selector function. 
Now, before I dive in, here's a little explainer on the notation that I'm using here. X means don't care. No matter what value appears in this field, it has no impact on the result. T means true or asserted. Conversely, F means false or not asserted. It also means not true, and that's probably obvious, but I just wanted to point that out because it's terminology I'm going to use later. L means low logic level, and H means high logic level. The actual voltages these represent are specific to the type of logic family that's being used, but the voltage isn't important. You can also think of L as a zero and H as a one. Now, in the truth tables you see in data sheets for logic ICs, I don't think you normally see the T and F like I'm using here, but don't worry, I'm gonna explain later um, why I'm using this uh, uh, particular notation. Now, the first four rows of the table deal with invalid jumper settings. What's, what it's expressing here is that if no jumpers are selected, or if more than one jumper is selected, then the clock output will always be low, as those are invalid settings. We don't really care what the actual clock inputs are in those cases. Now, the next two rows deal with the 4 MHz clock input. As you can see, if the 4 MHz clock is the only one selected, then the clock output mirrors the 4 MHz clock input. It's similar for the next two rows, uh, describing the 8 MHz and the 16 MHz inputs. Now notice there are only three cases in the entire table where the output is high. If we ignore the don't care inputs in each of those rows, then the highlighted boxes in each row represent the AND inputs in each product term of the logic equation. Then, evaluating the entire equation, we see that the clock output is high when the first highlighted row is true, or when the second highlighted row is true, or if the third highlighted row is true. This is a sum of products for our clock selector. As I mentioned before, false is the same as not true, so let's replace the Fs in those highlighted boxes with a slightly different notation. And now I'll write that out using a C-like syntax. Well, this is essentially how the logic equation is written in the GAL source file. The syntax is just a teensy bit different. And here it is, the equation that describes the clock selector function. Here's the truth table for the read-only clock speed register. You can see it's very simple. If clock cell 4 is selected, then the register reads as 1 because the CPU speed is 1 MHz in that case. Similarly, if clock cell 8 is selected, it reads as 2, and if clock cell 16 is selected, it reads as 4. All the other combinations read as 0, which makes sense because all the other combinations also result in no clock output. This is what the code looks like. At the top, we have the type of device we're compiling for along with a short identifier. Next are the signal names and their pin assignments. Pins 1 through 12 are on the top, and pins 13 through 24 are on the bottom. These are the three clock inputs from the counter chip, and these are the three inputs connected to the jumper block. Now, you notice that these signal names have a slash in front of them. This means that these signals are active low, and the result is that the GAL assembler takes the value from the input pins inverter. This is why I prefer to use the terms true and false for these kinds of signals. These signals are true when the logic level is low, and declaring it as a regular active high signal and then inverting it in the equation can be a little confusing. By inverting it in the declaration, it lets you think in terms of the actual logic you want rather than focus on what you know the, the signal levels are. Rounding out the rest of the inputs are the bus interface signals. The naming and semantics of these signals are borrowed from the 65C21 PIA. The chip select arrangement in particular provides some address decoding flexibility. Here's the clock output and the data bus outputs. Next up is the clock out equation, which you've already seen. Just to emphasize the point I made earlier, in each stanza, because these signals are inverted um, in the pin declarations, a clock in term without a leading slash means true when low, and a clock in term with a leading slash means true when high. In the latter case, the GAL assembler connects that particular term to the non-inverted input of the pin, rather than the inverted input, as would normally be the case uh, with a pin declared active low. Looking further down the file, these are the equations that make up the clock speed register that can be read by the CPU. The T suffix on the data output signals indicates that the outputs are to be tri-stated. And also notice that the upper bits of the register that are always zero are just internally connected to ground. Then finally, the enable equations for the data output signals simply state that the outputs are enabled when all the chip select inputs are asserted and when the read-white signal is high, 
and when the system clock input is high, which is the standard behavior for all 6800 family peripherals. One of the outputs of the GAL assembler is a handy chip diagram that can be used as a reference when drawing the schematic and when laying out the circuit on a breadboard. And, well, here it is, the first cut of the circuit on the breadboard. I have my scope connected to look at the E and Q outputs. For these initial measurements, there are no other loads in the signals, just the scope. Now, I just want to note that after I took this photo, I rearranged some of the pins in the GAL, so there's no need to point out in the comments that the wiring shown here doesn't match the diagram you just looked at. Okay, so let's uh, see some traces. Here's the output with clock cell 4 selected, E in yellow and Q in blue. As expected, I'm getting a pretty nice 1 MHz clock signal. This is what it looks like when clock cell 8 is selected. The output frequency is 2 MHz as expected. And finally, with clock cell 16, we see a nice 4 MHz output. This is a trace of E versus the special E signal just for the CPU, the latter being the blue trace. As you can see, the 74ACT109 is able to drive the output right up to the same level as the other signal that comes from the strong pull-up. In fact, it has an even faster edge, although I'm kind of wondering if that's a byproduct of having used a small signal MOSFET rather than a bipolar transistor. I did a little experiment and saw that loading the signal with 100 ohms pulled the blue signal down significantly, whereas the E signal from the 74ACT109 was just barely affected. So I think for now I'm going to go ahead and eliminate that special E signal as it doesn't really seem to be needed. When Motorola wrote the 6809E datasheet, TTL was a commonly available technology, and those logic families had difficulty driving heavy loads due to their relatively high internal impedance to VCC. Today's CMOS logic families, especially the 74 ACT with its relatively high drive strength, they don't really have those same limitations. One final scope trace. Here are E and Q connected to a Hitachi HD63C09E, which is a CMOS part rather than an NMOS part like the original Motorola 6809. So the loading conditions are a little bit different, uh, but you can see overall that the signal looks perfectly acceptable. There's a teensy bit of overshoot and undershoot, but I don't think it's really anything to worry about, uh, certainly not at this uh, stage of the design and build. And so here's the final clock generator circuit with a clock selector gal in place and the special e-signal removed. Never mind that uh, some of the other signal connections you see, um, I haven't really mentioned those yet. I'm going to be covering those in future videos. I'm just kind of getting a little ahead of myself here. And so here's the final circuit on the breadboard, tidied up a bit, and hardwired to 1 MHz for now. With my bench meter, I did verify that the CPU speed register output is correct, and that those outputs are enabled only in the expected conditions. So I think we're done with this module. In the next installment, I think I'm going to cover the reset circuit and some of the other basic connections needed to make the CPU function. And when that's done, we should be able to observe the CPU running code, which is pretty exciting. And one last thing, if folks out there are interested in a more in-depth tutorial on GAL programming, and specifically how to program them with open source tools, then let me know in the comments below. There are already some GAL tutorials floating around, but none of them really cover using the open source tools to my knowledge. So if there's enough demand for such a thing, I think I could probably put something together. And with that, uh, thanks a lot for watching and hope to see you again soon.